All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to, let me just mute this guy here. There you go. Um, welcome to session 4030, uh, Ocean uh, Theoretical to Applied Science. Um, I want to welcome both the attendees and the, the speakers. We have here on the slide a list of, of our speakers for the day. Um, before we start, I just um, would like to begin by acknowledging uh, the indigenous people of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we uh, each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between na uh, nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. So I just want to um, remind the presenters that you have 12 minutes uh, for your presentation. When you hit 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a two minute warning. And then you have three minutes uh, to answer questions that might pop up on the, the chat. All right, so uh, we can go to our first speaker, uh, Will Perry. He's going to um, present uh, the the work entitled Modeling Wave Ice Interactions in Three Dimensions in the Marginal Ice Zone of the Beaufort Sea. We'll go ahead and stop sharing mine so you can share it worse. Okay, uh, can you see that? It's low. Can you hear me? Yeah. And um, can you see that? Yes, uh, just need to put in presenter mode, there you go. So I can start? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, I want to thank everyone for being here and showing interest in this work. And I hope uh, the work that I present can be useful to you and whatever projects you're working on. So modeling wave ice interactions in three dimensions in the marginal ice zone of the Beaufort Sea. And I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Mike Marion from the University of Newcastle, Australia, and my colleagues at BIO, Bash Delaney, Mike Casey, Young Chen Hu. And without these people, this work wouldn't be done. The picture shows you ice flows. The small yellow dot in the middle is a wave buoy bouncing around pancake ice. So it's probably a meter and a half in diameter. So I would talk about uh, theory, uh, properties uh, of the models, um, field experiment, and results. How to model propagation scattering of ocean waves in the marginal ice zone. The question has been around for several decades. And today I'm going to, uh, in lightning speed, go over six possible models and show you some of the properties and why I think one might be better than the others. But you can debate that when you see the results. So, you can glaze over this a little bit, but I'm just going to discuss in qualitative terms what these six models are. The first one or two models date from uh, decades ago. Uh, Anthony Liu and Molly Christensen uh, from 88, and it's basically a layer model. So it treats the ice flows like a, a viscous layer over the top uh, of the water. And so one of these versions, I see zero, has no scattering. And the other version has a kind of uh, ice scattering uh, among the flows. And it depends on ice flow thickness, concentration, and diameter. The third model by Mike Mann, our colleague in 2014, is also there in WaveWatch 3, WaveWatch Wave Model. And it's, it's a kind of polynomial fit to some field data. And it has some characteristics to what they observed in terms of scattering. So these three models are in WaveWatch Wave Model. And anybody can download the model and play with these models. The next three models are models that we put in WaveWatch. And, and so uh, they, they're a little more uh, complicated. Uh, they're based on scattering theory. So if you remember uh, your undergraduate physics where you talked about scattering of particles on a target, there would be a kind of integral expression like the one on the bottom. So incoming wave and outcoming wave and an integral to collect all the incoming and outgoing waves 
against the scattering top uh, target. And this is in classical uh, physics literature, this is called a Boltzmann integral. And so the, the basis of a wave model is like that. It's the basis of wave scattering on a target, the ice flows and the outgoing waves from that. And so uh, we, we built this into the wave watch model. Uh, the important points are the scattering amplitude, uh, the randomness of the flows and the dependency on the ice characteristics, ice concentration, ice dimensions, and ice thickness. And so that's the fourth model. That's, that's the BIO model. It assumes rigid ice flows that can partially uh, submerge, and, and it's based on uh, engineering. It's based on how uh, waves and ships interact. So Michael Isaacson back in the 1980s, and we adapted it and Yann Masson pioneered the development of this in her PhD thesis in 1989, I believe, but we adapted it to wave models. So that's the BIO model. The fifth and sixth models, they're like the BIO model. They're based on scattering of waves on a target, and uh, they assume more things like flexible flows and directional scattering, and they change some of the dissipation. So there, that's the six models. What are the characteristics of these models? We choose an idealized rectangular ocean with water on the left side, the blue dots, and ice flows on the right side, the yellow dots. So 750 kilometers uh, by 750 kilometers in this picture, and uh, prescribed ice concentration, flow thickness, ice uh, dimensions, and uh, prescribed wind, for example, 20 meters per second. So way back uh, some decades ago, a young Chen Hu and I wrote this paper looking at this kind of model. And what we saw in that, those early runs were the sensitivity to concentration. So as the concentration increases from 20 to 50 to 75, the attenuation of the waves propagating into the marginalized zone drastically change. Uh, but uh, it's not so sensitive for flow thickness. So one, two, three meter thick ice, uh, it's not so much, but this is just one model. What about all the six models? So we've done simulations for a variety of ice flow types, and you can just see the selection that we have here from thin, small flows to two meter thick, big flows, 40 meters. And you can see how the different models have different characteristics in terms of how the waves attenuate. So this is attenuation, like radiation attenuation, dE dx over e, as a function of frequency for the different models. And you can see they're vastly different. And so what does this mean when you try and model operational waves going into the Arctic, into the marginal ice zone? Well, first of all, look at the attenuation. And so these two plots show the difference, uh, the change in wave heights as waves propagate into the marginal ice zone at the dashed line. So the energy grow, grow, grow in the open water and then once it hits the ice, the marginal ice zone, the different lines show the different model variation from BIO model in blue to uh, sort of magenta color MVS model to green IC2 model. So this is a log log plot. Those changes in attenuation are orders of magnitude as a function of uh, fetch going into the ice flow. And uh, the bottom curve just shows the change in uh, dimensionless uh, and dimensional peak frequency. So as the waves uh, attenuate, then the frequency moves to higher frequencies. And you can see that on the right part of this plot. We, we, we prescribed different flow characteristics in these runs, and we considered other, other possibilities in a couple of publications. What about slatting fetch? Because in the real ocean, uh, the waves are never orthogonal to the ice edge, they're always slanting. So the wave direction is propagating maybe 45 degrees into the marginal ice zone. And uh, uh, it seems that my label has slid to the left. MIZ should be on the right side of these plots. I, I don't know how to account for that. But one thing that's interesting is that as the waves hit the ice edge, they grow, grow, grow. So that's the color bar showing high waves just at the ice edge. And then they turn, they turn towards normal in every case. So the top curve is the BIO model, the center curve is the MVS model, 
and the final curve is the MBS prime model. And the way they, the uh, difference in attenuation is shown by these models. So MBS is not very attenuated if the waves even keep growing, uh, whereas MBS prime is more dissipation. But the same characteristic in all of them is the turning aspect of the waves. So here's what we got from these simulations of idealized cases. We've got big variations in different models. So if you choose a, one of these wave models, and you want to use it in marine forecasting or climate studies, you need to know that not all wave ice interaction models are the same. They attenuate very differently. And uh, turning, there's turning of the dominant directions entering the marginalized zone. There are other issues like flexure of ice and ice breaking and ice flow distribution, which we haven't really touched on much so far. But real storm cases are what we need. And so this is a real storm case. The sea state boundary layer experiment from 2015 in the Beaufort Sea, we were part of this with a collection of American and international uh, researchers. And we put these instruments in the Beaufort Sea to measure waves propagating into the, uh, into the marginalized zone. And this shows you the track of the ship, the Sikiliak, as it uh, spent six weeks in the Beaufort uh, going through this track, going near the ice edge, deploying instruments and measurements, and the storms passed by. As you can see, storms would enter and leave during that six weeks time. And so this is the basic data set that we have for waves propagating in. So here, here's the idealization for how to test our models. We would simply put the instruments in the water, we would measure the waves, and then we compare with the models. It sounds easy. We collected two, two big storms, one in October 11 to 14, and a slanting fetch case, 21 to 24. Easy, right? But the problem is the buoys always move. They don't stay like this. And so here's a sort of a little animation of the buoys for that first storm. And you see, as time progresses, the ice edge two, changes. Two minutes left. Two minutes. And, and so that's the problem. The buoys are always moving. So we always had to collocate the output with the buoys. And, and so here's the first case. There's almost no ice. The buoys are distributed like this. There's a photograph of the ice. The second case is the buoys are distributed near the ice edge. There's real ice and there's turning. So can we see this in the models? And so here's the second case. And here's the track of the buoys moving in the ice edge. And you see, there is a big difference between observations in red and the six buoys, six models, and this is time series of wave height in the bottom. So which one is right and what's going on? The distribution of the buoys shown on the left and the observations on the right. So the, the model is on the right side. And what you see, if you squint your eyes and look really closely, is the turning effect. So from the very outer buoy, uh, in the bottom to the very inner buoy, the, the peak waves turn to the right. And here's what the attenuation looks like. One, one the attenuation for the different models at the peak of that storm for various buoy uh, configurations. So each point, each uh, track is a different configuration of those buoys with the model output at that point. And so here are my conclusions. When there's no ice, the models are all the same. And that's a good thing, <laughs> no attenuation. But when ice is present, we can show scattering attenuation and tuning. And it appears that MBS prime has the best uh, has the best result. And I will end there and welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, if anyone has questions, please uh, type them in the event mobby Q and A uh, box. Um, right now, we don't have any questions, but Will, if you want to head um, to the the event mobile platform, you can also answer the questions that pop up. Um, oh, we have some some questions for you there. Um, so if if you can go there and, and answer uh, those mm -hmm. questions, that would be great. How do I uh, find that? In the interest of, of time, we're just going to move to our second speaker. Um, so 
on here. So Hal, Harold uh, Ricci is going to talk to us about an overview of concepts coupled environmental prediction systems and their applications. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I'll put this in uh, presenter mode. Okay, well, thank you very much, Juliana, and others that are here. So co-authors on this are Greg Smith, Drew Peterson, and Fraser Davidson, together with many other Concepts collaborators. So Concepts is the Canadian Operational Network of Coupled Environmental Prediction Systems. And uh, this is a collaborative multi-departmental initiative involving Environment and Climate Change Canada, Department of National Defense, Canadian Coast Guard, Canadian Space Agency, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and the National Research Council of Canada, who are working closely with Canadian academia and international partners <clears throat> together to deliver and sustain environmental prediction products and services to Canadians, researchers, industry, and government. And in terms of uh, applications for DFO, for example, as fisheries and ag agriculture and ocean climate monitoring, for DND, situational awareness, anti submarine warfare, and operational support. For the Canadian Coast Guard, search and rescue, environmental emergency response. And for the Canadian Ice Service, uh, high pressure areas, and uh, iceberg and, and automatic uh, um, systems production. And for the Canadian Hydrographic Service, the uh, uh, electronic navigation. And also for National Environmental Emergency Response Center, oil spill is a, is a big focus there. So this shows uh, the various systems that that uh, that we have. So the couple global coupled medium range deterministic system (GDPS) is uh, that's the atmospheric model coupled with the global ice ocean prediction systems. The atmosphere is at 15 kilometer resolution, and the ice ocean is at a quarter degree resolution. And the main focus here is 10 day predictions. The coupled global ensemble forecasts uh, with the, uh, that's the GEPS, that's the atmospheric component. And again, GEOPS at the same, uh, same uh, quarter degree resolution. 20 members, 15 day forecast daily, and a 32 day forecast once a week. And then in the regional uh, ice ocean prediction system, for the North Atlantic, Arctic, and, and North Pacific Oceans, a uh, finer resolution four to eight kilometers. Uh, the Canadian Arctic Prediction System uh, is for Pan-Arctic, and uh, it's uh, three kilometer resolution over, over the, uh, that area. And then we have two coastal ice ocean prediction systems on the East Coast at between two and three kilometers resolution. And then on the uh, West Coast, uh, at the same resolution, but also with a 500 meter zoom over the Salish Sea. And then for seasonal to uh, interseasonal uh, predictions, we have the CANSIP system with the uh, cl climate centers GCM three and four models with improved uh, sea ice, and then also with the global environmental multi-scale NEMO CICE model at one degree with, with 20 members. And there also are six port modeling systems uh, running at uh, resolutions as, five, as high as uh, 20 meters, uh, running experimentally by the Canadian Hydrographic Service. Those are for Kinemat, Vancouver Harbour, Lower Fraser River, St. Lawrence Estuary, St. John Harbour, Strait of Canso, with the domains uh, indicated in the, the panels on the right. Uh, between four and five year hindcasts have been completed and evaluated for each system and preliminary forecast evaluation completed and all models evaluated and approved by DFO peer review process. And the Vancouver Harbor, Fraser River and St. John Harbor systems are transferred to the CHS and, and running in real time. So in terms of data simulation, Environment and Climate Change Canada has two operational systems uh, for the GEOP system at a quarter degree uh, and for the REOPS uh, system, the regional at a 12th of a degree. And the uh, GEOPS is, uh, as, as outlined before, REOPS is doing 84 hour ice ocean forecast. And that's also used for the, the CAP system. 
Data simulation is using a multivariate seq filter system to simulate some um, Mercator version 2, uh, developed by Mercator Ocean. A background error for multi year high cast and simulates sea level anomaly, sea surface temperature, in situ temperature and salinity profiles. And that's blended with the 3D variational ice analysis that ingests Canadian ice surface charts and satellite observations, as well as a 3D VAR temperature salinity bias correction, an incremental um, uh, analysis update uh, on one day in GOPS and seven day window in REOPS. And REOPS also includes uh, tides and atmospheric pressure. And on the right, you see a online sliding window tidal filter that allows non-stationary tides, for example, from sea ice, and also permits the improved of, uh, uh, use of satellite altimetry to constrain surface currents. Uh, the uh, surface water uh, ocean topography SWAT satellite mission is a very interesting uh, uh, activity. So that's wide swath altimeter mission launched in December 2022. The calibration and validation phase started in April 2023. And then uh, it's going to provide uh, understanding of fine scale ocean circulation for better surface drifts for oil and search and rescue, for example as well as estuary and river applications. And there are several uh, Canadian projects funded by the Canadian Space Agency, uh, one being a observing system simulation experiment to uh, assimilate synthetic SWAT observations in REOPS. This has shown important improvements in surface currents. And now working on assimilating samples of actual SWAT observations and recently real-time feeds that Greg Smith presented in his presentation yesterday. And uh, the CAP system, the Canadian Arctic Prediction uh, System, that supports weather prediction for northern Canada, and in particular for the MED areas, as outlined by the triangular domains uh, on the upper right panel. For emergency uh, marine response to study impact of fine scale uh, interactions, and that gave support to the Year of Polar Prediction community. Uh, the details are, are repeated from a previous slide uh, of the configuration. It's run uncoupled since January 2018 and then fully coupled in June, but it was decommissioned in February of 2022 following, following up. But that's to be uh, reinstated in 2024 for the, uh, the Arctic prediction. And on the right, you see the REOPS domain, and then now you see the uh, overlay, the CAPS region um, domain as well. And then, uh, for example, for this interaction of small scale coupled uh, effects, we see the flow through fjords and potential impact on, on local ice drift. Um, the fluxes for boundary related interactions in the marginal ice zone and coastal polynias and leads in sea ice. And those are illustrated in the bottom figures there. The sea ice concentration, you see the fjords and the uh, and the um, polynias, and then you see the impact on the surface air temperature in the bottom figure. Also, the global ensemble coupled sea ice forecast, this was presented yesterday by, by Drew Peterson, developed in response uh, for um, ice services for long range forecast guidance, again with 32 day coupled forecasts uh, weekly. Uh, uh, with 21 members, and uh, also some new um, this, uh, metrics introduced, the stochastic probability score, SPS, that we see uh, on the right-hand side there uh, with uh, improved values from the, uh, the ensemble prediction. Even though the system is under dispersed due to a use of a single ice ocean initial condition, nevertheless, it does show valuable skill with respect to the deterministic system and persistence throughout the year and largest errors occur during the melt season. Products are disseminated uh, th uh, through MSC open data with GOPS and REOPS uh, links ind indicated there. Also the GeoMet and Ocean Navigator uh, as presented by uh, Vanessa Sutton Pandy in the, uh, the digital um, twin ocean ditto presentation yesterday and their internal feeds for Government of Canada clients like Ice Services, National Defense, Fisheries and Oceans, and the Coast Guard. 
uh, international connections uh, very involved in Ocean Predict with the various uh, participants in that indicated on this, uh, this diagram here in a little bit more detail, uh, supporting the uh, UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. There's a Decade Collaboration Center. Uh, Coast Predict is a major project for end-to-end -end ocean prediction in coastal regions. 4C Project for Advancing Science and Impact uh, Ocean Prediction. And then Observing System Co-Design for Best uh, Observing System uh, design for various end uses and SYNOPS, the project for enabling best use of ocean observations in systems with feedback uh, to observing systems. And then the ditto, as I mentioned earlier, enabling better accessibility, exploitability, and utility of prediction and observations throughout the whole value chain. Two so, minutes left, Hall. Okay, thank you. So we'll conclude looking at areas of focus for future research and development. So first of all, for ensembles to provide better estimates of model error for data simulation um, with the ensemble of initial conditions to support probabilistic forecasting and then ensemble analysis and forecast to provide uncertainty estimates, which is a frequently requested uh, product. And then finer scale coupled forecasting on the order of one kilometer for improved atmosphere ice ocean exchanges, uh, boundary layer fluxes, for example. And then a new configuration to combine uh, some existing ones and, and going to uh, the higher resolution to support needs for emergency uh, response, uh, search and rescue along all Canadian coastlines, including in particular the north, which is a, a new important focus. And then using the wide swath altimeter SWAT uh, that we saw earlier to constrain smaller spatial scales. And then finally, historical reconstructions or reanalyses uh, to produce a 30 year long simulations that's needed for initializing the CANSIPS seasonal to um, interseasonal. And then also the JETS um, ensemble systems provide better understanding of errors and uh, for extreme events, uh, turn rates, which is a big focus of this Congress. And then opportunity to make case studies, for example, the response to extreme events, and then also training data sets for artificial intelligence-based forecasting. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hal. That, that was great. Uh, I still don't see questions in the q and I think there is a maybe a, a little delay as well. Um, so do you have the, the platform open there? How, uh, the event movie? Yeah, I will, I will go to that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just keep an eye on the Q and A box and then okay. if any questions pop up, you can, can answer them then. There. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That was very interesting. Um, all right. You can move on to our next speaker. Let's see here. So Charlie, Charlie Hebert uh, Pinard is going to uh, talk about the impact of a simulation of absolute dynamic topography on Arctic Ocean circulation. Oh, Charlie, go ahead. All right. So um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm going to uh, present the impact of uh, assimilation of absolute dynamic topography on the Arctic Ocean circulation. Uh, that is a study that was part of the Clean Arctic project that was made in collaboration with the people mentioned here. Uh, so uh, the people here from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Collect Localization Satellite, and Newcastle University. So um, the ocean circulation is uh, usually constrained to the assimilation of sea level anomaly from satellite altimetry. Uh, though there is a limited benefit from this assimilation in the Arctic Ocean due to the data gaps that is present um, because of the presence of sea highs. Uh, also, it is challenging to estimate the mean sea surface uh, that is essential as part of the observation process. Um, the reason uh, of, the, of this that challenge is that the MSS may be biased toward uh, summer condition or simply unavailable where there is ice covered. Uh, also, the existing MSS solution uh, may be decreased in a that are recently melted. 
So as part of, of, of this project, um, we had two uh, alternative altimetry products that were produced by CLS. So the first one is the sea level anomaly with estimation under heights from leads. So we call it SLA leads. And the second one is the absolute dynamic topography that we call ADT. So the question that we wanted to answer in that project was, uh, what is the impact of assimilating satellite altimetry data under sea ice? Uh, does the assimilation of a direct ADT have an impact on Arctic Ocean circulation features? And finally, which is more advantageous uh, for the Arctic Ocean, assimilating a lower re resolution grid direct ADT or higher resolution SLA that required MDT estimate? So uh, first, let's just introduce what is the absolute dynamic topography. Uh, here we have a small scheme uh, on the right uh, showing the different variables that are um, included in the SSH um, calculation. So uh, we usually use an SLA, uh, which is an anomaly uh, with respect to the mean sea surface. Um, and for that, we need an MDT, which is the mean dynamic topography. Uh, but here we wanted to assimilate the ADT, uh, which is like the direct field, uh, that we only need the geoid uh, as a reference. So uh, for that uh, product, uh, we use the geoid, which is the combined gravity field model uh, constructed by ingesting both satellite altimetry data and ground data. Um, maybe we can note that there is a small reduction in spatial resolution over 83.5 uh, degree north because of the limited spatial coverage of the ghost orbits. So from that, uh, the people from CLS, they produce the gridded direct ADT field um, by combining along track ADT data from three satellite altimeter through the optimal interpol interpolation. Uh, also, the um, along track processing was similar to the one described in Prandi and all, if you want more details. So the final product is an L4 product, so on a grid, uh, a 25 kilometer grid uh, with three day temporal resolution and a coverage from 50 degree north to 88 degree north for the period of July 2016 to June 2020. So we wanted to assimilate uh, that product in our uh, system, which is the regional ice ocean prediction system, REOPS, that was just present uh, in the, our presentation. Um, so the system has the NEMO size uh, model with a CREC 12 grid with a nominal resolution of three to eight kilometer and a 75 vertical level. The data assimilation um, component is, um, is SAM2, a multivariate reduced order extend, extended Kalman filter uh, with the detail mentioned here that I don't want to go uh, more about, about that. So we had to do a few uh, model adjustments to be able to assimilate the ADT field. So the first thing is that the observation error um, had to be changed. So we usually have an MDT estimate, so we had an MDT error, but in that case, we needed to change it for an ADT error. So we put um, a zero error south of 80 degree north and 20 centimeter north of 83 degree north with a linear ramp to account uh, for the geoid error. And we also had a five centimeter uh, on all the domain uh, for the instrument and specially correlate errors from the optimal interpolation. Uh, the other change that we had to do were about the resolution. So as we can see on the right uh, graphic, um, we have the power spectrum density for uh, on the top, the um, direct, direct ADT and the classical ADT, uh, which is like SLA plus uh, MDT. And we can see that there is less variance in the direct ADT fields at wavelengths less than 200 kilometer. So for that, we need to project the innovation from ADT into larger spatial scale only. So the innovation are the difference between the observation and the model. Um, so for that, uh, we have to filter the background errors. So the background errors are the um, covariance matrix uh, that determine how the information from observation is spread to nearby grid point. So in our case, we apply an additional 100 Shapiro passes um, to have a, a more appropriate field for the ADT. So it was a good compromise allowing reduced variance below 200 kilometer uh, with minimal impact for long length scales. And finally, uh, the last modification we had to apply was um, the model filtering in the observation operator. 
Um, so the observation operator uh, calculate the difference between the observation and the model equivalent, so the innovation. Um, and to avoid the misrepresentation of small scale as error, uh, we had to smooth the trial fields uh, also. So with those change, uh, we were able to assimilate that product in our system. So to evaluate uh, the impact, we create three reanalysis uh, over the ADT coverage period. So the first one is the control run, which is based on the operational version of REAPS. The second one is the one assimilating the ADT. And the third one is um, the SLA leads. So it's the same configuration as the control run, but it includes the SLA on the right. Uh, to evaluate, we compare the mean sea surface height, the circulation and volume transport across key Arctic gateways, and the sea ice drift. So uh, let's start by, by looking at the mean sea surface height. So here we have um, first the mean, mean sea surface height for uh, the control run. Uh, we have the difference between the ADT and the control and the difference between the SLA leads and the control. So we can see that there is a significant impact of uh, the new altimetry product on SSH. So up to 10 centimeter for the ADT and 20 centimeter for SLA leads. Uh, in general, we can see an increase in SSH in the Arctic shelf regions and a decrease in the central Arctic Ocean. Um, we can also infer uh, inflated Beaufort gyre uh, because of the steeper east-west gradients. Um, also, we can see some significant change near the North Pole and in Fram Strait, uh, suggesting change in a, to the transpolar drift. And finally, uh, we can see some notable difference in ADT reanalysis showing lower SSH offshore of the Norwegian Sea. So here that we don't have in the SLA leads. If we uh, look after that to the current, so here we have the same uh, plots, but for the, the mean currents. Uh, in blue, here we have a slower currents and in red, faster. Uh, so what we can see is that we have an important intensification near the North Pole and in the transpolar drift. Uh, we have some smaller scale impacts present in Frame Strait along the Laptev seashelf break and near the Barents Sea opening. Uh, also, we can see some impact on the structure of the Beaufort, Beaufort gyre. So for the ADT, we have a reduction north of the Canadian Arctic archipelago and an intensification along the Alaskan coast. Uh, for the SLA leads, uh, we have a pronounced intensification north of the CAA. Um, to evaluate that those um, different um, uh, current, uh, we look at the volume transport to the key uh, gateway. Uh, so here we have a table with um, the mean uh, volume transport uh, through all those uh, those uh, gateway um, in slow drop and the positive value denote transport into the Arctic uh, and the negative one is out of it. Uh, we have for the two other runs of the ADT and the SLA leads the per percentage of difference uh, with respect to the control. So what we can see is that we have an opposite response in that volume exchange with Arctic Ocean for ADT and SLA leads reanalysis. So for ADT, we have significant increase in volume transport to CA, and for SLA leads, we have a general decrease in net volume transport between the Arctic and North Atlantic, and an increase in transport in Barrow and Jones Strait explained by the SSH difference. Two minutes, so Charlie. Great, thank you. Uh, it's difficult to evaluate the change in the ocean circulation because we have only a few available observations. So another way to uh, evaluate it is to look at uh, sea ice drift. So here we have um, the, um, the OCSAF data, so the Ocean and Sea Ice Satellite Application Facility um, on the right. So we have the average uh, value for OCSAF and the difference with the control. Uh, so we can use it as a general guide to assess the response in ice drift. So what we can see on, on our two runs is that we have an intensification of the ice drift along the Laptev sea shelf break uh, in both runs, and it's in agreement with OCSAF. Also, we see uh, a reduced drift speed along the shelf break north of the Barents and Kara Seas, uh, 
implying an offshore displacement of the transport drift. Uh, for ADT, ADT, it's consistent with OCSAF estimates, but for SLE lead, uh, the displacement seems to be exaggerated. So in conclusion, uh, the direct ADT field was successfully assimilated to REOPS system after a few technical change. Uh, the assimilation of satellite altimetry retrieval from leads shows significant impact on SSH circulation and ice drift in the Arctic Ocean. And there are notable differences between the ADT and the SLA leads reanalysis, probably due to the MDT estimate. And finally, the results suggest better representation of Arctic currents by assimilating the direct ADT. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. That was great. Uh, let's see if we have questions. I don't see anything for now in the Q and A. Um, and we still have like a few minutes to go. Well, maybe maybe I will ask a question for the meanwhile. Um, you know, I saw that, that there is really a big difference for the SLA leads uh, in narrow Strait. It's like more than 20% uh, difference in transport. And I know that you mentioned that like observations are limited to, to um, evaluate uh, the model, but have you tried to look at like literature that shows like narrow Strait transport and see if the numbers um, match better? Um, oh, yeah, there was some comparison done with the literature. Um, I don't have it right here, but uh, maybe that's something that I can add in the Q&A uh, discussion. Sure, sounds great. Yeah, so uh, keep, keep your eyes in there in the box. If any questions pop uh, in there, uh, please uh, answer them over there. And we are a little bit early, but um, I can I can wait a little bit more and see if uh, any questions will will show up. Otherwise, we can move to our next speaker. Oh, there you go. I have a question for you, Charlie. Do you have an idea of how much more spatial coverage the SLA lead has compared to the reference run? Um, yes, uh, well, maybe I can uh, share my presentation again. Oh, sorry. So basically, uh, well, all the domain uh, where there is uh, ice we usually just don't have any um, SLA data assimilated. So all that domain is, uh, well, in that SLA leads uh, run, we have those data and also in the ADT run. So I don't have the exact grid here, but uh, we can see that it's a big part of the domain. Hope it's answering. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's set it up for our next speaker. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, let's see here. Go. So our next speaker is uh, Luis de Henrique da Silva. He's going to talk about modeling the Baffin Bay seasonal freshwater content and budget. Please. Okay. Uh, sharing the screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, may I? Go ahead. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Juliana. Thanks for joining us today, this afternoon. So my name is Luis Henrique. I'm a PhD student at the University of Manitoba, working with Dr. Juliana Marson as part of the Porto Group. Uh, I can summarize my PhD as as a work to helping in helping to understand better the the freshwater dynamics within Baffin Bay. Uh, this, PhD, this PhD is basically motivated by previous studies, such as, let me get the pointer, uh, Hain 2015, 
uh, where we can see Baffin Bay as a huge reservoir of fresh water and also based on Bamber 2018, where uh, we can see that the decadal freshwater flux from land into the bay is increasing. Uh, it seems like more interest sometimes to study this variability in the interannual or interdecadal perspective. Uh, however, we decided to start uh, this PAG uh, understanding the freshwater content within Baffin Bay in a seasonal uh, time scale. So to do that, uh, I, we calculated the freshwater content within the area delimited by those magenta lines here. And uh, those magenta lines also show the position of the sections where we calculate the freshwater flux through advection. Um, we, we integrated the freshwater content only from surface down to 200 meters depth, and the freshwater flux was also calculated uh, considering only this, these layers. We also calculated the freshwater flux across the 200 meter layer uh, from and into deeper layers. Uh, to do that, we use uh, the NEMO ocean model coupled with the lame 2 c ice model and also coupled with the ICB module would allow, which allow us to simulate icebergs trajectory and deterioration, which means that uh, the icebergs are considering spreading fresh water uh, over the bay instead of only fresh water input when calves. The configuration uses the ANA4, which stands for Arctic and Northern Hemisphere Atlantic Ocean with one quarter horizontal resolution. We, the configuration has two open boundaries, one near the Bering Strait, another one at the South Atlantic. We simulated the ocean and sea ice conditions from 2002 to 2017, but to calculate the climatology and analyze the seasonality, we considered only the period between 2005 to 2017. The model was the model initial conditions and lateral boundaries we got from the from oceans and sea ice we got from glories to v3 the runoff and greenland iceberg calving rate we got from day tremor and baby 2018 and the atmosphere forcing we use the cgrf data set so let's go to the results. Uh, and the figure on your left, you have like the overall freshwater content spatial distribution over the entire period of analysis. Uh, it basically follows the general Baffin Bay circle, uh, general circulation in Baffin Bay. We have the less amount of freshwater content on the eastern side of the bay, where we have saltier and warmer waters. And the freshwater content increased towards the western side of the bay, where we find like fresh waters and cooler waters. The figure on your right is the annual time series of the total freshwater content for the entire bay. Uh, we can see that it has a minimum of freshwater content in April, May, increasing steadily to reach the peak in September, then decreasing again as the, 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 the fall and winter, winter arrives. Aiming to understand what controls this time variability, we calculated, we estimated freshwater flux from several source, uh, lateral and bottom, uh, advection and convection, right? Uh, runoff, the sea ice, uh, freshwater flux, precipitation, minus evaporations, and iceberg meltwater. Uh, based on the model outputs, uh, the results shows that the sea ice freshwater flux is the major contributor with the to the net freshwater flux, although maybe some of the minor contributors may play an important role from a local perspective. Uh, the run uh, as expected, the, ru the run of freshwater increased during the summer, uh, reaching the max contribution during July, uh, contributing with around 20% of the total, the net freshwater flux into the bay. If we sum it up all the source and sinks, we ended up with the net freshwater flux, which is positive from May to September, coinciding with the increase in the freshwater flux that I just showed in the previous slide. And it's negative from October to April, also coinciding with the decrease in the freshwater content that I just showed in the previous slide. 
So to understand what happens within Baffin Bay, after this, all this freshwater flows goes into and out of the bay, we applied uh, EUF analysis in the climatological field of the freshwater content. Uh, so as, as you might know, the, the EUF by itself doesn't say much. We have to find physical explanations on to the patterns that we see. So in the figure on your left, you're seeing the EOF number one, which explain about 82.8% of the fresh of the total freshwater content variance. Uh, we and in, in the figure on your right, you have the principal component, which shows the temporal variability of this pattern. In this study, we decided to focus on explaining what happens in the center of Baffin Bay, as well the coastal areas, and the negative sign along the Baffin Island shelf break. Based on, what we have, based on the results that we have seen so far, uh, we started the investigations looking into the sea ice freshwater flux. So the figure on your right, now you are seeing the accumulated freshwater flux from May to September. Uh, the, the pattern matches well. It doesn't. It's not the same. It's not exactly the same since the freshwater when when the sea ice melts, the freshwater gets a bit uh, dissipated and moved by the the, the ocean currents. Although this it's, it represents well um, the the central part of the bay, but doesn't explain what happens in the coast. Uh, based, based on the same idea, uh, it seems like the coastal areas coastal areas are explained by the accumulated freshwater uh, flux by runoff, uh, which uh, reached the maximum accumulated uh, about uh, August, September. But neither the freshwater from sea ice nor the runoff helps to explain what happens along the Baffin Island shelf break. For that one, it might be related with the Baffin Island current transport. And the figure on your left, you can see the annual Baffin Island current transport, which is negative all over the year, indicating an outflow all over the year. Although it is stronger in September, October, matching with the period of the decrease in the freshwater content depicted by the EOF number one. Water. Um, last but not least of our analysis, uh, we have the EOF number two, which explain about 12% of the fresh total freshwater content variance. If, you sum, if we sum it up uh, the EOF one and two, we end up with about 95% of the total variance explained. For this one, we focus on explain what happens in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago shelf and Dave's straight vicinities. Starting with the, the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, uh, it seems like it's being driven by the ac horizontal Ekman transport due to the sea ice and wind. So it, the, melt, the, the sea ice meltwater during the summer is being pushed by the horizontal Ekman transport toward the Baffin Island and the Canadian Arctic Archipelago shelf, which accumulates that fresh water during the winter. And when this pattern, this spatial pattern that you see in December here dissipates, the fresh water accumulated starts to recirculate. The last one is the negative patch here on the Davis Strait vicinities. This one might be related with uh, an inflow across the Davis Strait of saltier water during the late fall winter. So we can see in the, the top figure here, the right top figure, you have the, the meridian of velocity, the average velocity for December, January. And if we compare the salinity profile, uh, the salinity section from December, January to July, August, we see that during the winter, the water that flows into the bay is saltier. If we zoom in the area and overlap, minutes, please. all right, thanks. If we zoom in the area and overlap the average 
the anomaly velocities for December, we can see how that saltier water propagates into the bay, decreasing the freshwater content. So that's the story that I planned for today. Uh, this is the three main points that I would like you to take away with you. So Baffin Bay is a freshwater, freshwater content increase from May to September and decrease from October to April. Uh, it's mainly driven by the freshwater flux due to the sea ice cycle. And although the spatial pattern might be driven by the, the, the sea ice phenology, uh, it's modulated by local forcings like wind and sea ice driving, ocean currents, and maybe smaller processes that the simulation can't get. My next steps uh, are actually now evaluated the freshwater content and the fluxes in a long-term uh, perspective, and they're trying to understand uh, the interannual and interdecadal variability of the freshwater within the bay. That's it. Thank you very much. This is a video with Baffin Bay with in a not so happy day. Thanks. That's it. Thanks, Luis. Let me check here if we have questions. All right. Not yet. Uh, okay. In the, in the Q and A part. I'll wait a little bit because we have a few minutes. All right. No worries. Anything people don't get seasick. Oh yeah. <laughs> Staring at the. Mm -hmm. the ocean there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. I have a question. Okay. Are you able to include freshwater runoff from the CAA in your forcing? Yeah, the from the day in Tremberg, we have fresh water from the CAA, if I'm not mistaken about it. Is this simulation, I think you use also the um, hydro GFD uh, model outputs to force it? Maybe? I'm not sure if it is one, but if, yeah, if, uh, if, uh, if yes, we do have also, right, the, yeah. the CAA. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is another question. Uh, mm -hmm. There seems to be a low area near Cape Christian in EOF2. Can you explain what's going on there? I don't know <sighs> Cape Christian. Cape Christian would be the small blue area here. Oh, okay. I guess if the people, the person that gave the asked the question could confirm that for me, because I'm sorry about that but I, I do not have the, the name for all the capes around there. Otherwise, yeah, that might be it. Yeah. I can, I can follow the, 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 the question and answer that. Uh, oh, if, yes. If the have... person said yes. <laughs> OK. Okay. Oh, yes. So just to follow, uh, nope. <laughs> uh, just, uh, no, I, I still do not have. Uh, I, I, I base it on the evaluations. Uh, this is a feature that is showing up in the model outputs, but I can see that happening uh, in the observations. So I didn't put too much effort in that, to be frankly, uh, because I didn't see that on observations on my comparison my evaluation to to check okay uh all right we have one more question quickly here uh can you differentiate between magnitudes of freshwater inputs from lancaster sound versus jones sound versus smith sound uh this is something uh yeah so here i just showed the like adva uh, the advection term like everything but uh, the paper that i'm preparing, uh, I'm, I have a table, I'm sorry that I have not this here today, with the transport, the fluxes for every single gate. Uh, so that that is something that I have done. I just don't 
don't have this here for this presentation today. I'm so sorry about that. It's okay. All right, thank you so much, Luis. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, Madurima uh, Chakrabarty will talk to us about modeling iceberg severity on the East Canadian coast. Madurima, you can open your camera, share your screen. Um, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. And I can see your slides. Go ahead. All right. Oop. Uh. Uh, right, so hi everyone, I'm Modurima and uh, uh, from my master's thesis, I am looking into the factors playing the key role behind the severity of iceberg seasons in the east, Can east coast of Canada. And to, okay, I cannot change my slides. Can you see that? No, yeah, now you can. Um, so to start off with a little bit background, um, almost every year, hundreds to thousands of icebergs um, from the um, tidewater glaciers around Greenland travel to uh, the east coast of Canada and populate the, the transatlantic shipping lanes over there. Um, and so the iceberg ship collision rate is really high in this um, Grand Banks region in particular of the Newfoundland coast of Labrador Sea. Um, and so uh, when Titanic happened in 1912, Titanic uh, disaster happened, um, the very next year, International Ice Patrol was established. Um, and ever since they monitor this um, water of North Atlantic enclosed by this yellow box, and later they uh, collaborated with Canadian Ice Service um, and started offering um, season forecasts and other data sets. And from those data sets, we chose to look into um, the most popular one that assumes the season severity. It is called I-48N. And uh, um, it's basically the number of icebergs that reach 48 degree north latitude. Um, as shown in this figure. And so um, as, the, as their monitoring technologies evolved time to time, they divided their entire data set into um, three periods, three reconnaissance periods. And for each period, um, they assigned um, uh, ranges of numbers um, for, the, they, they assigned ranges of numbers to classify the season severity into four different categories, light, moderate, heavy, and extreme. And um, they also define the season severity, uh, they also de define the season, iceberg season from October to September. So, so uh, to explain that, for example, if I say 1995 was an extremely severe iceberg season, what I mean is from October 1994 to, to, to September 1995, we had um, more than 1,398 icebergs crossing the 48 degree north latitude um, southward. Um, so the season, the iceberg sighting season basically starts in February, ends in August with a peak somewhere in April or May. Um, and this seasonal pattern is more or less consistent, uh, consistent over the decades, but the interannual variability, um, especially in last few decades, has um, increased uh, rather abruptly. And as Louis was just explaining, um, from the the uh, discharge from Greenland um, data sets, we can see that you know in a warming Arctic, we can expect more solid discharges from the Green Greenland glaciers. And so it is of utmost interest, uh, sorry, importance to understand what are the factors that playing the, um, what are the factors that are determining the, the variability of the iceberg seasons in the Grand Banks region. And um, that's important to be able to uh, predict the upcoming season severity. So um, the prior studies um, uh, kind of pointed out that these um, 
could be potential contributing factors behind the variability. Um, so a sea ice extent in Labrador coast and Davis Strait, uh, sea surface temperature in Labrador Sea or North Atlantic oscillation, and also um, calving, calving distributions from the Greenland glaciers can play big roles. But unfortunately, any of these studies or none of those studies unanimously agree upon which one of the above or previously mentioned factors um, is playing the, the most significant role. And so that is um, one of the two major driving forces for this study. And also we lack observations up north. So um, remember the yellow box I was showing from the I, uh, IIP reconnaissance region, outside of that box, we do not know what is happening. And so we do not have enough data to form a hypothesis there. So we need to take advantage of the numerical model um, in order to um, represent uh, the iceberg's behavior upstream. And so that basically boils down to the research question and the methodology that we are using here. And um, for simplicity purpose, we uh, divided our divided the factors, the, the potential factors that we are analyzing into two different um, types. One is local and the other one is remote. And for the local, we are looking into the ocean temperature and the sea ice over Labrador shelf. Whereas for the remote conditions, we uh, enlisted Greenland calving and Baffin Bay sea ice condition. And these are the data sets that uh, uh, we are using uh, for model, uh, sorry, for the observational data analysis, as well as the evaluation of the model. And for the, for the model part, um, I'm not going into any deeper um, explaining the model, Luis just did in uh, the previous talk. Um, so we are using NEMO ICB. And for this particular simulation, we are using um, sea ice locking mechanism um, to represent the iceberg's movements in the Baffin Bay more realistically. Now for the observational part, um, the previous studies used the sea surface temperature. So basically the skin temperature of the ocean and that too over the entire Labrador Sea. But in this study, we found that um, if we average the temperature vertically, it shows a better correlations with the I-48N, which is the number of icebergs um, reaching 48 degree north. And um, also we took the temperature into account only over the Labrador shelf, because that's where the icebergs are traveling through to get to the 48 degree north latitude. Um, and since the icebergs drops usually in North Atlantic reach up to 90-ish meter below the, the um, ocean surface, we uh, decided to average the first 100 meters of temperature um, of the ocean. And uh, we, we chose that for our first local parameter to look into. And in this graph, we see uh, the temperature anomaly over the winter temperature anomaly over the Labrador shelf uh, plotted as a time series against the observed total I-48 and anomaly, yearly total. And as you can see, in general, a positive temperature anomaly is associated with a period of um, negative I-48 and anomaly. So to have a better look in that, um, we plotted, um, the like the spatial uh, things across the severity classes. And we can see that uh, in the right hand side, we can see that um, the ocean over the, the Labrador shelf region is clearly much colder than the climatological average um, during, the, during the winters of the heavier or the more severe iceberg seasons in comparison with the less severe iceberg seasons. Moving on to the sea ice condition, which has a better correlation with the um, I-48N with more uh, statistically significant value. And we can see that the anomalies basically follow the, the same sort of trend. And it's, it's the same story being said in, a, in, a different, in different words. Um, so towards more uh, the sea ice condition is heavier on the uh, Labrador shelf region um, during the winters in the more severe iceberg seasons than the less severe iceberg seasons. 
And for the remote conditions, uh, we started with the Greenland calving. Um, and since we couldn't find any um, reasonably good correlation between the Greenland calving, the entire Greenland solid discharge with the I-48N, we decided to divide it into different sectors. And after dividing into different sectors and taking out the decadal trend from both the I-48N and the regional calving data set, we found that um, from the more northern sites, the calving shares positive correlations with the I-48N, whereas from the more southern sites, we have negative correlations. Um, so um, could that the, could the reason behind it be the uncertainty in the calving data sets, or could it be the, um, the lag introduced by the travel time um, taken by the, the icebergs coming from different regions? Two, two minutes. Thank you, Juliana. And so even after taking into account the, the lags from different sectors or um, different time, the, the time of calving, we could not see any striking differences between the um, striking differences among the contributions from different sectors um, across the severity seasons. So we moved on to the uh, to our final um, factor that we chose um, to look into, and that's Baffin Bay winter sea ice condition. And to make it more uh, consistent with the model that we are using, we chose to look into the sea ice extent with the highest concentration over the Baffin Bay. And to separate the signals, we divided the Baffin Bay into four quadrants. And in this particular figure, we see the sea ice, concentra sea ice extent with highest concentration from the northeast quadrant of Baffin Bay. And that more or less uh, follows the trend as the um, yearly total of I-48N. And also, it gives us um, some reasonable uh, well, when we plotted it across uh, the two um, data, uh, two sorry, to, uh, all the severity seasons, we see that towards the eastern side of the Baffin Bay, we see more uh, striking contrast between them. Um, so, before I summarize the entire thing, I wanted to uh, go with a little bit of preliminary model evaluation. Even though the numbers are hugely underestimated, we can see that the season is um, nicely represented by the model. So these are the take home messages uh, for this talk among the local um, among the local uh, factors, uh, the winter sea ice condition shows uh, better in interconnections with the I-48N and among the remote factors, calvings, cal calving from Greenland did not have much clear influence on the I-48N, whereas the winter sea ice in Baffin Bay, especially in the eastern sectors, show uh, exhibits similarities with the, um, the iceberg severities. And so it could be uh, could have some impact on the upcoming season. For the future steps, we wish to evaluate the model output once they are there. And if we find any um, worthy looking at sort of um, relationships, uh, we might uh, do a sensitivity study afterwards. But for today, that's it. Thank you very much. I would really appreciate if you have any questions or suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Valurima. Um, I'm watching the the chat here and the Q and A. I still don't see questions for you. Maybe we can um, give it a, a few seconds. Sometimes the there is a, a little lag. But yeah, I see. I see you have the um, the event mobi there uh, mm -hmm. open. So if you see any questions for you, you can address them uh, in the in the chat box there. Thank you so much. We can move on to our next speaker. So Modurim, you can stop sharing. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so our final our final speaker, Andrew Hamilton, is gonna talk to us about bringing out your data. A new, uh, there is an exclamation point there, a new hydrographic data compilation for the Canadian Arctic and surrounding seas. Great. Thank you very much, Juliana, especially for emphasizing the exclamation mark. So um, thanks, everyone. I'm Andrew, uh, based at University of Alberta and working on this project with uh, Cao da Silva, Isabel Puerta Alvarez and uh, Paul Myers. 
And of course, there are many, many uh, data contributors that uh, are not listed yet, but we'll get to that. So uh, I want to start with a question is, is, why are you here? Why are we all here? And the reason we're here is because you have the most interesting, most extraordinary, and most groundbreaking research question of all time. So for example, maybe you want to calculate freshwater content in Baffin Bay, like Louise, or the Beaufort Gyre. Maybe you want to look at warming of the Atlantic water layer temperature in the Canadian Arctic, or assess changes to water mass structure along northern Ellesmere Island or investigate spatial variation and vertical diffusivity in the Arctic Ocean, and of course, many other uh, great research questions. Um, but what do you need to investigate these questions? Well, ultimately, you need ocean temperature and salinity profile observations, and that's where I come in. So when you start off your research project, generally, you want to know what ocean observations exist. So you'll go to a, a, an open public source like the World Ocean Database, which is a, a plot on the right, shows uh, what's available in World Ocean Database as far as CTD profiles in Baffin Bay. Um, and you'll note very quickly, of course, that the Canadian Arctic is generally a relatively data poor region, both in time and space, as far as the number of profiles that have been collected historically. Um, but furthermore, what you'll find out is that what data does exist is actually scattered amongst various archives. So World, World Ocean Database has some data, but as an experienced observational oceanographer, I can look at that plot on the right and tell you that there's actually quite a bit more data than is available in that particular uh, data set. So you might access other data sets, including MEDS, DFO, and the uh, recent CIOS. Um but they're, as I say, scattered amongst various uh, databases. And then, unfortunately, what you'll find when you download data is that there are variable levels of quality control and assurance. So some example temperature and profile, uh, temperature and salinity plots on the right there will show you some of the data that's contained in, in these public archives uh, that needs, obviously, quite a bit of quality control yet. So what's the solution here? The solution that we've uh, come up with is to create our own high quality accessible hydrographic uh, database, uh, preferably of all existing temperatures and salinity profiles from the Canadian Arctic and Baffin Bay. Um, and so what does this entail? Well, first of all, it entails compiling a complete database, um, hopefully to make it a bit of a one-stop shop for ocean profiles. Uh, so first and foremost, we'll get what data is available from the big uh, public archives like MEDS and World Ocean Database and others. Um, but most importantly for this particular project, we put a lot of effort in rescuing lost data. So that's any data that hasn't really been published or archived in one of these uh, big public archives or is just otherwise not incorporated in a uh, accessible database. Um, and then uh, second step is we really want to standardize and make the database accessible uh, by integrating both the data and metadata data together into uh, single files and standardizing all the field names so we don't have to deal with a whole bunch of different uh, nomenclatures. And then finally, a very important step, of course, is quality control. So removing duplicate, duplicate profiles from all the various uh, data sources, removing outlier data points, gradient checks, et cetera, and trying to use quality control methods that are uh, international standards in, in this um, project, which is very much a work in progress. All right, so speaking of the work in progress, where are we at so far? So uh, we have a database that is being built. Its name is yet to be determined, but if you're a rich philanthropist and you wish to attach your name to the database, I'm willing to negotiate, so contact me afterwards. Um, the data range for this database right now extends from 1908 to 2022, hopefully uh, with intentions to update it annually as we go forward, but we'll deal with phase one at the moment. The domain, as I mentioned before, was originally the Canadian Arctic uh, north of 60 degrees north and Baffin Bay. However, as we've obtained some data sets and they have pushed the boundaries of that uh, original uh, domain outward, we're now at a pan-Arctic greater than 50 degrees north and include the Hudson Bay complex. Um, at the time of publication right now of this presentation, we're at 32 uh, data sets and growing with 18 of those are uh, kind of rescue data sources that are not available otherwise in the big uh, public archives. And at the moment, we have greater than 480,000 uh, profiles from uh, this region with a, a list of some of the sources on the right there. Um, and even more importantly is the Wall of Fame. So these are both individuals and organizations that have contributed data to this project thus far. And I'm really hoping that I'll be able to add some more names to this list shortly. 
Um, all right, so let's give you an idea of what kind of coverage we have thus far. So of the 480,000 odd profiles, this is what it looks like so far. Um, so this uh, unfortunately does not map every single data, data set that we have in the database just yet because it is a work in progress, but it gives you an idea of the coverage that we uh, currently have. And I will note that the uh, variation in the southern extent uh, in these areas is just due to the changing uh, domain scope of the project over time. So uh, we're quite happy with the coverage that we have thus far, but of course, you know, there are still some areas like the uh, Russian Arctic um, and uh, Northern Canadian uh, shelves that uh, are a bit lacking in data. And then you have overachievers like the Europeans in the Barents Sea and then uh, uh, the Beaufort uh, Sea Project. What does it look like in temporal distribution? Well, the first profiles in this database were collected way back in 1908. Um, but then, of course, we saw a increase uh, after World War II in the 1950s with a, a big increase in 1980. But a lot of that is artificial because it's the inclusion of a big data set called the U dash data set, which is an Arctic Ocean uh, wide data set. And that only began in 1980. So this is not uh, actual indication of the actual number of profiles taken uh, every year. It's more an indication of the number of profiles in the different data sets at different times. But if we want to focus just on Baffin Bay, so for example, before the database was created, this is the uh, spatial distribution of profiles from the World Ocean Database. And then after our database, uh, this is what it looks like now. So we've managed to fill in a lot of the gaps. If I cycle back and forth, you can see along uh, Greenland in particular, we filled in a lot of data and extended into Nares Strait and Lancaster Sound um, and fleshed out um, data in other parts as well. Um, for a temporal distribution in Baffin Bay, again, this is what it looks like with a, a uh, you know, some, some decades are good decades for as far as data collections in the 1980s was pretty good. And then we had a quite a increase in the uh, late 1990s and then it dropped again and, and increased after that. So we've been a little inconsistent uh, over time with our data collection in the Arctic, which is not a surprise. And if we look at this on a per year um, histogram, so this is actually a histogram over each month of the year. Um, so month one being January, month 12 being December and distributed each plot by year. So we see in 1908, we had a few profiles collected in about August uh, with a very intermittent uh, data collection after that. And not until sort of the 1980s did we start to see more consistent uh, data collection with a, a standout year being 1998 during the Northwater Polynia project where they managed to collect data over uh, several months in the year. But otherwise, we see very much a seasonally uh, summer dominated uh, signal with some uh, pretty low years even in uh, recent decades where not a lot of data was collected. Um, we can look at it in a map sense, and we can now get a better idea. So, for example, in 1998, there was that Northwater Polynia um, project. So even though there was a lot of data collected throughout the year there, it was focused mainly on the Northwater and uh, other parts of Baffin Bay are a bit more scant. If we want to focus on uh, one year or uh, uh, two years in particular between 2001 and 2002, we see it's a year where there actually wasn't all that much data collected uh, in Baffin Bay, but it happens to be a year that uh, some of our uh, groups start their Nemo Ocean model. Uh, the initial conditions are started in that year just as a, an artifact of, uh, of past uh, data sets that are available. Um, and so, for example, if we compare our ocean observations in blue with the Glories uh, version, uh, Glories 2 version 3 in uh, Baffin Bay, you can see quite a difference in the temperature profiles between uh, the uh, reanalysis product and the observations. Whereas if you compare it with a more recent Glories version, 12v1, uh, we actually have much better comparison. So your choice of initial condition project product really does matter depending on what year you're starting your runs from. We can also uh, look at this from a research perspective. Uh, so zooming in on Lancaster Sound between Devon Island and Baffin Island, uh, we can look at the scatter of data collected uh, over the years. Uh, in the 1980s, there was a, a big push and then in the later 2000s. And this is a research project of interest to mine. Um, where I'm looking at the Atlantic water layer, and we see that um, in the early years, these are colored by uh, year. So back in the 1980s, uh, we had uh, this kind of profile 
um, where you had Atlantic water temperatures maybe one to one and a half degrees Celsius. And in more uh, recent decades, in the 2010s and onwards, we're seeing very much a shoaling of the Atlantic water layer and an increase in temperature to about two and a half degrees Celsius in some years. Two minutes, Anger. Thank you, Juliana. If we want to uh, jump to northern Ellesmere Island as another example, we have uh, a, a smattering of data over the years, depending on uh, what project was in the region, with a definite increase in recent years due to the, due to the Woods Hole Ice Tethered Profiler project. Uh, but just want to note, for example, that we see this new water mass uh, coming into the region in, uh, in the 2000s and onward. Uh, which is probably indicative of Pacific summer water. So there's there's lots of uh, interesting questions that are available um, as we peruse this data set. And I will note that it's still a work in progress. So you see the odd uh, temperature salinity profile that's a, a bit anomalous and that is needs some quality control still. So in summary, uh, we're compiling a comprehensive temperature and salinity database for the Arctic, and we're hoping the utilities are many. So ocean climatology studies, uh, ocean model evaluation. Hopefully we can improve some of the reanalysis products by uh, providing this uh, comprehensive database to some of the global ar archives. And then there's scope for many research projects. Uh, within our group, we're really trying to semi-automate the quality control and assurance steps because there's a lot of data to go through and we want to integrate them into some of the other uh, big conflammations that we are aware of. And then most importantly for this audience, I want to say that we're still in the uh, process of rescuing lost data sets from a variety of sources. So I know DFO and the Canadian Hydrographic Service, uh, Department of National Defense, et cetera, have data sets that I'm still trying to acquire. Uh, but for this audience, I just want to put out a shout to say rescue lost data from you. If you have lost data sitting on a external hard drive or something in your office, please contact me and bring out your data consider contributing your data to this uh, project and we will most certainly add your name to the wall of fame and more than likely become a co-author on uh, on further publications that will come of this. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Andrew. Um, that, that was great. I think I speak on behalf of all oceanographic community when I say thank you very much for doing that. Uh, putting so much effort into into this. This is just amazing. We have a few questions for you here. Let's see. Um, Yu Yu is asking, uh, will you publish the data online and have a user interface that is easy, easy for users to access, select, download profiles uh, data? Yeah, excellent question. And absolutely, you that is the intention. It might be a, a little longer term. Um, so first and foremost, just trying to uh, finalize phase one of the data set, if you will, and try to get it uh, out and published, uh, certainly within the coming months by the end of the year at the latest. Um, uh, but with it, with that, it would definitely be publicly available for download. And I absolutely would like uh, to have a, a, a GUI interface where users can uh, independently select and export uh, data sets uh, or, or subsets of the data uh, for their own particular interests. So that is absolutely of interest. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, another question is, uh, is it possible that some of the profiles uh, have been assimilated in producing Glories 12? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, some of the data sets are for sure part of Glory's uh, 12. Um, but I what, what I've been surprised at working through this project is that um, often the right hand doesn't talk to the left hand when it comes to the big data archives. And so there's not always communication. For example, the MEDS database does get ingested into the World Ocean database, uh, but not vice versa. Um, and so it really and, and the World Ocean Database doesn't ingest some of the other data sets, like DFO has other data sets that don't get ingested, that sort of thing. Um, and so um, whatever um, uh, data sets that the Glories uh, product uses and ingests as far as in-situ observations, it certainly will contain some of the data that's in our compilation, but I'm quite confident in saying that we have already compiled more data than would be would have been available to the, the Glories to uh, reanalysis product. Excellent. And we will definitely, the goal is most definitely to share it with, with all these individuals so that, mm -hmm. and organizations to improve the uh, real, real analysis products. 
agree. I uh, have other one here. Thanks, great in initiative. What is the standardized format of the data that you have settled on? Yeah, so right now we've settled on uh, using net CDFs and um, a ragged array uh, type of net CDF. Um, but knowing that a lot of oceanographers still work in MATLAB, myself included, um, I also currently have the database in, in uh, MAT style format uh, as well. Uh, but the ultimate goal would be to make it available in, in a variety of different file formats, uh, depending on, on user interest. Um, that shouldn't be too hard to, to code up. Mm -hmm. And one more here, how can we access the metadata to determine if our old data sets are already captured? Yeah, very good question. So that's something that we're trying to be very good about is uh, is retaining all the metadata that's uh, with the source data as it was uh, provided to us. Um, so within the uh, NetCDFs, we do have a variety of metadata fields and then also have um, included the entire header, if you will, of metadata from original data so that people can look through the data sets and uh, decide whether their data has already been incorporated or not. And that, that's a kind of a work in progress for me to, to identify kind of key metadata fields that uh, different organizations and people use to identify their own data, because it does vary quite a bit. So some people use the cruise name, others have a very specific um, profile or, or cruise identifier. Um, some people are quite nebulous and don't really have an identifier. Um, so it, it's kind of all over the place. And I, I welcome more direct input uh, from everyone as far as how they would like to be able to search the data set in that regard. Yeah, that's 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 great. And I mean, it, I would suggest as well, like just contact Andrew uh, and mention which data you have, and maybe he can tell you if he, you know, has um, it in the in the database already or not but just in case make sure that you talk to him yes please please very much contact me and i i yeah. i'm hoping within the coming months to put up a website that starts listing all the data sets that we've collected thus far and then you can kind of have a look and, and see whether yours might or might not be in there already so thank you excellent well thank you so much andrew and thank you for all our speakers for um presenting your very interesting work and thank you for everyone that attended. Um, so I think that's it for our session. And I think next uh, we have the award ceremony. Uh, so please uh, feel free to, to jump into that as soon as it starts. I think we might have a little break here in between. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everyone.